The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's Red Team Roundup. We are so excited to bring you guys some awesome Red Team content for the next five hours with some amazing speakers and some awesome sponsors. Um, the first thing I want to tell everybody is today we're going to be in the Wild West Hacking Fest Discord server in the live chat channel. So we're going to send a link through the GoToWebinar chat now for everybody so you can join us there. Um, if you have any questions for the presenters, that's going to be the perfect place to ask them. And all the slide decks from today are going to be posted there as well. Awesome. Corey? Thank you again for agreeing to um, chair this event today. We're, we're very excited to have you. Um, so thanks for all your time and your effort uh, and all of your help putting this thing together. Hey, thank you, Vilda. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, the talks that we've got coming up today. We have some fantastic presenters. And I know we've already had a, a couple in our green room um, who have uh, are getting ready and, and are excited. So uh, it's going to be a great day. It's going to be a great day. Corey, you want to talk a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so uh, I work, uh, I'm a senior security consultant for Red Siege. Um, got about five years uh, experience doing pen testing and red teaming. And uh, yeah, uh, just living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. We all are. <laughs> Well, I um, every time we do this, I always have to see where people are from. So I always put my my favorite GIF in there that says, "You are now in Nebraska," and I'm I'm sorry because that's where I am located. So we'd love to hear where everybody else is from. Um, so if you could maybe put your GIF in there without maybe what do we what do we do? We we say we don't want you to tell us just what would make us realize where you're at. So if you want to add your GIF, that would be fantastic. No gifts. <laughs> there we go. Too. It's a good thing. They're like me. They'd be fumbling. Where, where this, where's the gift tab? <laughs> <laughs> and Jake, we are less than two weeks away from the kickoff, right? We are. <laughs> I'm super excited. Although we'll probably suck again this year. <laughs> Fingers crossed. It's going to change, right? It's got to get better. It's got to get better. It's got to get better. <laughs> um, as a Washington uh, Washington football team fan, I can tell you that's not accurate at all. Um, <clears throat> we've been rebuilding for about 20 years now, and we're not better. Just, just sorry. It's just What's not going to happen. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm not really sure where Proggy Digital's from, but uh, that's a pretty awesome gift. I'm going to have to save that one. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that is funny. <laughs> maybe Orlando. Orlando. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Megan had to put her hearts on there. I like that. There we go. Virginia. No gift, but in New Hampshire. I miss New Hampshire. It's a very pretty state. Why am I looking at a GIF of Mickey Mouse twerking? Because I'm guessing that's Florida. <laughs> I like how you just jumped to that conclusion. Uh, that's, that's Florida. Oh, it was Man, actually a Florida hate going, wow. Yeah. I'm from Florida. Well, I'm not from. I live there now. So I'm allowed Which part? to uh, Which part? Um, southwest uh, Cape Coral. So. Okay. Yeah, down there. Yeah. I'm in the Panhandle. So. Oh, I'm in, nice. I'm technically in the, in the south. But I live by the beach, so... It counts. Cool. It's still Florida, though. Yeah. Where? Where are you? My sister lives in Destin. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm right next to Destin. So I'm in Santa Rosa Beach. So, oh, sweet. Uh, yeah. Destin has like a really good, like Destin Beach has like has some really good Thai restaurants. Um, yep. Cool. Yeah, it's okay. beautiful. Way really too much time at the Air Force Base down there. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah. that's Hurlburt, right? Isn't it Hurlburt down there? Hurlburt and Eglin. Hurlburt's a little bit further. Yeah. That's more Port Walton Beach. Uh, Eglin is the kind of north of Destin. And then you've got Tyndall Air Force Base, or Ten yeah, Tyndall in uh, Panama City. But yeah, I'm uh, I'm east of Destin. Um, so it's like I think less than my five sister walk is to the beach. Okay. Yeah, like I think my sister's actually, her address is Santa Rosa Beach, too. 
Okay. Well, that's that's where I'm at. So, it's, uh, who's your neighbor? You, should, you guys should hang out. Go. Pretty cool. <laughs> there you go. go. I know there someone you, you know. I should yeah. Ask you another. Oh man. So I just had a question in my in the Discord. Um, someone asked if this session will be recorded, and the answer is yes, it will be recorded. Always, always. So um, it will. It will just take us a, a little bit of time to to get it on on YouTube, but we will get it done. So. <laughs> wow! Very cool. I'm excited. You know what else I'm excited about? Wild West Hacking Fest in Deadwood. Yeah. Right on. Had on already. Hope. <laughs> well, get vaccinated, please, people, so we can have our conference. That would be nice. So. All right. <laughs> that I would like be. I like the advice. Rick, you got, you're got you doing some special stuff for this, right? You got some labs yeah, we coming got some in. We got some really exciting stuff for the uh, for Wild West and Deadwood. Um, so we have we have our, our labs, which we usually have some some really great labs we got going on. We have a, a big RFID lab uh, for RFID cloning and and hacking and uh, replay attacks and uh, you know just if people can figure their RFID wrong, you can, uh, you can steal the, the the keys and clone those. Um, and then we also go into mouse jacking. Uh, you attacking vulnerable keyboards and mice that are wireless uh really cool stuff there and and you can still buy them by the way uh we we actually bought one the other day and i was like hey i'm gonna check and see if this is vulnerable and it was so uh we we go while well, we have our labs walk through that if you've ever been to a deadwood or uh or a wild west uh hack and fest you know that uh our labs are very in entailed and uh, we also like sharing that stuff so um it's cool to get your hands in get dirty on that uh the cool thing is uh this year we also included um, some Bluetooth. We have some Bluetooth hacking uh, work going on. And also we have uh, uh, part of our swag bag, which kind of goes along with uh, with with uh, on-site as well. Um, our swag bag lab this year is, uh, if you're virtual, you get a idea, you get a um, do SDR. So we have SDR around that. And then there's also a scavenger hunt involved with that where you can win a coin. Um, and same with the on-site. The on-site one, we only had one person uh, at, at Way West uh, win that. So I'd like to see uh, us at least get, you know, quite a few more people win the scavenger hunt on-site as well. Um, and the scavenger hunt is kind of cool because we have hidden stuff everywhere. You use your swag bag lab, some of the components to, to do uh, find those, those, those things, and they'll lead you down the road. Um, so, yeah, it's really exciting. We're, it's always evolving. We're finding new stuff. Um, we're just just sharing this content and it's really cool. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, and we're actually having a hacking cast on that coming up too. Um, it looks like the 25th about some of the different things. So we'll go a little bit more in depth then. That'll be on the 25th. So if people aren't registered, go register. Um, come hang out with us. And did we get that link in the in the Discord? If not, I will post it now. I did put post Wild West Hack and Fest um, in the Discord, and I pinned it as well. Um, so we'll post we'll post this also. And we'll have some more fun stuff because it's uh, you know uh, five year anniversary, Back to the Future. Uh, we kind of got some theme stuff going with that, um, and also. Um, just a secret for people here, uh, there will be some Easter eggs throughout the conference. So uh, you might find yourself uh, stumbling across one of them. Um, and I think we have drawings or something with that. Well, this, so that'll be, that'll be very cool. It'll be, uh, should be fun. First time doing that. So uh, I'm really excited to see how that goes. It's going to be a really fun event. I'm, I'm probably more excited about this particular one because of the fact that we have a great theme um, with the hack to the future and some of the cool stuff. Dave, Dave Kennedy, we're going to have his DeLorean live and in person. Uh, we're shipping that in um, our, our uh, wild west hack and fest cowboy and his sons will be there teaching us how to rope. Um, I mean, we've just got, we've got, uh, uh, Meta CTF with our with our CTF obviously and Secure Code Warriors um, is coming in with our Code CTF again. Um, we've got uh, some awesome speakers, Dave Kennedy. Um, uh, just 
it's just going to be an awesome event and it's going to be super fun and if you've never been to deadwood um you're missing something it's a great great city it truly is a, a, a great place to go and it's a lot of fun and there's great things to see there so um i did post a link earlier um in the discord and i also pinned it so please feel free to go take a look and come on out to deadwood or join us virtually if you prefer um, we'd love to have you. It's going to be fun. I know Mr. Overstreet is, is already there speaking, and I believe Joe is going to be speaking with us again as well. So it'll be awesome. Yeah, Deadwood's a really fun conference. Uh, I had a blast when I went last time. And you were in Reno with us too, Corey. So it, uh, it was great to get to meet you in person there, and it'll be great to see you again. Yeah, Reno was a lot of fun too. Um, yeah, I, uh, I've been telling everybody next year I'll definitely be there. Yay. Yes. I'm really excited for, for the steak dinner. I mean, that's all I really go for. I mean, I, John gets to be <laughs> for free. I mean, like, that's just awesome. And it's awesome food. It's just the way to go. Yeah. But bring I'm excited in to be, conference. be at a conference. It's ShmooCon 2019, last in-person conference. So I'm just ready to get out there, and hopefully it all works out well. Oh. Yeah, I, I got to say Reno was was really, really it was weird because it was nice to get everyone together, but it was also awkward because we're like around right. people and mm -hmm. part of me was like, there's too many people too close to me. Uh, they need to step away now. Um, so it was a little bit weird to get back into that into that group. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, it was cool, though, getting to meet people who um, you've met online over the past like year you know, through Discord uh -huh. and all that stuff. And now it's finally you get to see each other face to face. Um, it was like that for a lot of coworkers too. So yeah. We have Grayson. We have Grayson in Discord said so just got back from DEF CON. If you could let us know what he thought of DEF CON, that would be great. Um, and Mike, you've got a halo. I don't know if you can hear me or not. But he just total light halo going on. I don't think he hears us. He's probably Mike, getting the, the go-to webinar. The red, the red team angel. The red team. <laughs> we were penetrated by angels. That sounds dirty. <laughs> no, it's not what I meant. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, my. Weird. There's That's what we the John's boss. <laughs> There's so many things in this industry that are like double entendres that we don't even think about. And they're like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> that does make sense. It's like backdoors and breaches way after the game was released. Somebody's like, that's kind of dirty. And I'm like, what? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It all depends on how you look at it. Yeah. 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 I, you know, if you're a normal person and you aren't, yeah, I could, yeah, we probably didn't think that through as much as we should have. Yeah. <laughs> Still a really fun game, though. Oh, it works out. No, there's some cool things that came out of Black Hat this year. I don't think there was anything earth-shattering. Um, there were some cool tools, some cool, cool cloud security auditing tools um, came out. Uh, but uh, I, don't, I, I didn't get anything. I don't know if anybody else, Corey, Joe, uh, Jake, uh, Rick, I, I, is there anything that you saw come out of, like, Black Hat that was like, oh my gosh, this rocks my world. Or Black Hat or Yeah, I, I didn't know. I didn't see anything. No, nothing, nothing crazy. But then I, I know this is being recorded, but then I am now part of the Cobalt Strike team, so I have a whole different world of stuff to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> so my perspective is, is got a new, a new set of blinders on over the last four well, months. So. How does it feel to get blamed every time there's a new malware strain that comes out? Uh, everyone's I, like, see, they're using Cobalt Strike again, guys. If we just got rid of Cobalt Strike, we'd all be secure, Joe. Well, I'm glad you said that, John. <laughs> uh, <laughs> boss is like, get off, get off. Um, yeah. But no, I, this has been an argument, I think, in the industry for a long time. There's a bunch yeah, of people yeah. in defense that think it's just an issue of finding tools and removing the tools, and then we won't have hackers anymore. I, 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 it, it's, it's frustrating me to no end um, in the industry. So I'll touch slightly on that that concept in the talk I'll do later later on. Gotcha. But yeah, it's it's very much binary. That that whole these attacks are one and done 
that there is one thing that causes all the problems. If that's the case, then we would have solved security years ago, you know, and we haven't yet. So, you know, tools come and go, techniques and stuff come and go. So it's a different problem set that we've got to deal with. Um, yeah. yeah. But yeah. Um, so I actually do feel, I, I understand now more how Raphael felt for many, many years. And wow, yeah. that dude, he was a machine to, to do, to, to do what he did and deal no, with what absolutely. he did that with. Um, and build it up from like like his basement. That that's that's so cool. Oh, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But my my favorite thing to say whenever it comes to like tools is I like I like my hacker tools to be on GitHub with well documented man pages and full source code. Um, and I also say if we can't detect these things, we've got a bigger issue in the industry. And I think we do. I think they're getting too focused on detect X, Y, and Z rather than looking at the broader tactics that attackers are using and trying to focus on those. But I think that that's also bleeding a little bit into your talk as well. But this is a preview, oh, yeah. everybody. This is oh, a yeah. preview of what Joe's gonna like drop on us. So we'll see, drop stuff. It's just my, my normal soapbox rant it is, <laughs> that's that's my <laughs> theme. <I'm> <laughs> I've done this a long time, so it's the same like, you know, theme and, you know, even argue that what I think I know, you know, I go back to but before I started, and thought I knew what was going on. There was people before me saying, "Yeah, we've already talked about this. This is nothing new." Oh. So we just keep yeah. repeating the same cycle over and over and over, thinking we know what we're talking about. I think it's pretty funny. You can go like read books from like I got books on my shelf from 1999. You know, um, yeah. hacking exposed version one and version two. And you go back and reread those books, and it's like, holy crap, this technique has been around since then. And it's fun because you know, being in this industry as long as we have. You see a lot of pen testers like, hey, this is a cool technique. Oh, my God. And it's like, no, no, that was in a book in 1999. Uh, that's, that's the way we used to do things, boys and girls. Um, so it, it, it's, it's kind of neat to see that stuff circle back around again. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And just for anybody who's um, just joining us now, this is not the actual roundup quite yet. This is what we like to call the pre-show banter. Um, as Jake's shirt says, we show up early, or um, I only show up for the pre-show banter. And that shirt comes from the phrase we like to say, we show up early because you show up early, you show up early because we show up early. And it's this vicious cycle we all love so much. Um, it's also just a great way for us to get to know you guys a little better and for you to get to know us a little better too. Um, if you haven't already joined us on Discord, please go and do that now. We've gone ahead and shared the link in the GoToWebinar chat for everybody. We're in the live chat channel today for any QA that you have or just any chat you want to bring into the conversation. Um, along with that, we will be posting the slides from each presentation into the slides channel in our Discord server as well. And Mike, I saw that you were able to join us again. Did you get your mic working? Can you hear us? Yeah, my mic is working, I think. Can you awesome. hear me? Yes, we can hear yep. you. Uh, now right, we have yeah. the camera. You've got two cameras. One of them is awesome, and this one, and let's okay. kill the light. It's, it's like burning my eyes, <laughs> my red <laughs> All right, so so that's good information. So it'll let me switch cameras. There you go. In the, oh, go. wait a minute. Okay, I see what's going Perfect. on. Perfect. <laughs> uh, that's on. much better. Are we better? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, would, it would let me switch cameras, but then it wouldn't let me like accept the camera switch. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, for some reason, this this meeting platform doesn't like my Linux system. So I had to switch over to my Windows system. Dude, OK, so that's a pet peeve. Because if you go to go to meeting, it like does the cameras, it does the audio like a champ. It works really, really, really well. As soon as you switch to go to webinar, it's like, well, I've never seen this before. Uh, well, yeah, it says, it says this system's not reported. See system requirements, and I click it, and it's like operating system, Linux, browser. I'm, I'm good, so I, you know, I don't know. You're screwed. <laughs> so it, it's funny. I, I think what happened is Zoom like, pulled up all the oxygen out of the room, and Zoom has great plugins for Linux, and it works really, really well. Um, and go to webinar and go to meeting. We haven't seen it actually improve in what it does um, in over a year. I mean, it works great for scaling, um, but we're actually we're actually going to be looking at like a different platform. Unfortunately, it's like once a year we have to reevaluate that. But I think one of the criteria that I want is it has to support Linux because like a lot of times Rick and I are running around and we're like, oh, crap, I've got to run Windows for something. Do I have a native Windows box anywhere? Because it hates <laughs> virtual machines, too. Right. Uh, no, we, 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 we feel you, man. We, we feel you. So. So, yeah, I'll uh, I'll try to keep my eyes on my camera. But uh, the uh, 
you guys are not by my camera. So if you see me kind of looking up and down, that's no. what's going on. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. They're trying to get me to get multiple cameras so they can do like the the switch. And I, I don't know. That just seems weird. <laughs> <laughs> then we could just hologram you, John. Just hologram you and you just, yeah. yeah there you go. Like he's got a lot of cameras for a guy doing something in his basement. I don't know if that's right. <laughs> Oh, so man. Mike is with Gardacore, and um, they're one of our sponsors. And I think he wanted to just chat a little bit about what's going on over oh. at, in his organization. Cool. So yeah, Mike, I, I was excited. I wanted to talk to you about that. Um, I think it's interesting. Like looking at Gardacore is you know we always talk about blocking and tackling and core fundamentals, and one of those fundamentals that no one listens to like ever is segmentation, right? Um, it's like, you need to segment your network and they're like, okay, yeah, we've got VLANs. I'm like, that's not, that's not what that means. And they don't understand the concept of segmentation, like whatsoever and why it's critical. And it's cool because Gardacore does a lot more than just segmentation. It does a whole bunch of really cool intelligent segmentation and detection on it, but at its heart, it, it does that segmentation. Uh, can you talk about why segmentation, especially with like ransomware, like from what you're seeing with your customers is so incredibly important. Yeah, I mean, the the bottom line is in security, we have, uh, you know, we try and keep the bad guys out, right? But we all know that it's only a matter of time before they get in, right? Like, if it's not your system, it's your neighbor's system, right? You know, it's 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 the person on the next floor down, like, they're getting in. Um, so then the question is, what do you do when somebody gets in, right? And that's your uh, defense in depth. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, segmentation is a really important part of that. Somebody's going to break in. Once they've broken in, how do they limit what? How do we limit what they can do? Um, and probably one of the best ways of doing that is limiting wherever they broke in. What can that access? Um, so, like the the example I like to use because it's uh, uh, I think it's it's kind of comical is like you don't want your smart light bulbs to have access to your database with the credit cards in it, right? It's like it, all of a sudden everything now is a network device. Um, and if I outfit my office with smart light bulbs, I don't want that to be the vector of attack. Like my light bulbs do not need access to my credit card database. Um, and this really just boils down to the principle of least privilege. I mean, I find, I think most things in security pretty much just boil down to the principle of least privilege. Does it need to be able to do this? No, don't let it do that. Well, uh, and one of the one of the concepts I'm always teaching my students is treat your internal network as hostile because it is. And it always right. blows my mind that computers are more secure at a Starbucks because Windows pops up and it's like, hey, uh, I don't know this network. Should I should I like put up my firewall and stuff? And it's like, yeah, you, you probably should. And it's like, okay. And when you get to an Active Directory environment on the inside of the environment, it's just like wide open, firewall down, you know, and the attackers move laterally so efficiently. Um, right. And I, I don't know, Mike, your thoughts, I would say it's probably less than 5% of the organizations that we see actually have a solid network segmentation approach in their environment. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have any numbers to, to say one way or the other, but that would not surprise me um, at, at all. You know, it, it's, it's not, it, for such, such a sort of like a fundamental thing, it does not seem to be as widespread as, as I, you know, as I think it should be. And not just well, because I work for Gardacore. I mean, I have like my home network is segmented, right? Like my wife's Windows machine is not allowed to talk to any of my work machines. Wise, <laughs> wise. Treat your right. wife's now. Teach your wife's computer is hostile because it is. It is. And my, uh, you know, we, we have, we, everybody should have a guest network so that when people come over with their phones and their laptops and they connect to your network right at home, you know, I, I, those things shouldn't then be infecting your machines. You know, worms shouldn't Ooh. be crawling from those no, systems house, to yours. At my house, it's the other way around. I put them on the guest network to protect them from me. Uh, <laughs> what kind of crap's going on? I'm like, uh, uh, I don't know, some responder maybe? Uh, NTLM Relay X? I, I don't know. Join and find out. Um, so that's funny. So, yeah, so I, I mean, it's such a fundamental thing that like it needs to be everywhere. Um, yeah. And and it, and really, it just boils down to the principle of least privilege. Does this web server need to access that database? Right? No. The, you know, does does this service need to access my Active Directory? No. Like, then don't let it do that because it, at some point that's going to you know be used against you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And at, at, at the workstation level, um, with the way that you guys run, uh, does it do that segmentation down to the individual workstation or is it breaking out specific LAN segments? Um, yeah, so, so it, will, it will do that down to the individual uh, 
in, down to the individual machine. It'll even do that down to the process level, right? So you can say these are the processes that are allowed to access these other network ports. Okay. Cool. And it'll then, do that for Windows and for Linux. You get to like Microsoft Outlook, and it's like I, I, I whatever, just go. Um, so, but no, I, I, you know, all joking aside, with that is. So like the setup, is this something that you have to put on every single switch that you have to hang off of the switch? Like it's, a, it's agent based. One? It's yeah, what? it's agent based. It's agent based. So uh, on each of your endpoints, whether they be laptops or servers or whatever. Now, are you hooking into like NetSH and utilizing that uh, or like, or is it completely hooking into the kernel and watching the TCP IP calls? Like where are you guys actually setting in that stack? Yeah, we have our own firewall that comes with that agent. Okay, that's probably wise. NetSH ADB firewall is kind of a nightmare. I was, I was, I was a bit curious about that. It's almost like we write on top of NetSH ADB firewall. I'm like, oh god, why? Um, so, no, oh, very cool. We're getting close. Four minutes. Four minutes. Yes. So I'm going to be here in and out throughout the day. Um, our our main host is Corey. Say hi, Corey. Hello. <laughs> and Corey works at like a competitor sat like slash sister organization. Do um, you want to tell a little bit about who you work with? Yeah, I work for uh, Red Siege, a uh, company founded by Tim Medine. Um, we uh, uh, started about four years ago, um, Tim by himself, and uh, now we just hit 10 employees. So we're growing fast, uh, doing all kinds of crazy work. So, so I've got to I've got to warn you about Mike Perez. Uh, one of the you know just just a heads up. If you ever share a hotel room with Mike Perez, he likes to watch The Dark Knight Returns on loop, like because he thinks it's like <laughs> it's like it's it's like the perfect movie. So he, he'll watch that again and again. So heads up. <laughs> uh, we also have Tyler on. Uh, Tyler is joining us today. Tyler, do you want to set up a little bit about yourself and your background? Hey, everybody. Nice to be here today. Thanks, John. This is awesome, as usual. Uh, and team, obviously. I know Velda, the kid, uh, Corey, all you guys. It's a ton of work to get these things going. But a uh, longtime red teamer, pen tester, guy that likes to break into just about anything that exists on the planet for a couple decades. And uh, currently over at Trimark with Sean Metcalf. And I've got my own consulting company that does some boutique, more exotic kind of uh, pen testing. So. Cool. Uh, that's a little about me. I was trying to think about it the other day. Uh, I think the first time I met you, I believe, was at a SANS conference, or maybe it was ShmooCon, I can't remember, at the Hilton on Connecticut Avenue, um, where Hick wow. Hinkley shot Reagan. Um, in fact, I think we actually met each other at the exact site where Ronald Reagan was shot. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't know if I've got that completely right, but I think we were hanging out with Mike Poor that night, which might explain oh. a little bit of my, my haziness. So. That that explains a lot of my haziness. Uh, I'm I'm yeah. positive, but yeah, I'm pretty sure you're right. It was uh, it was one of those very early SANS conferences. Yeah, <laughs> a long time ago. And then also Joe Vest. Uh, I've, I've been an instructor with Joe Vest in a previous life. Uh, we've known each other a really long time. Um, and Joe honestly is one of the people in the industry that um, I kind of watch very closely. What he's saying, especially in the area of red teaming and how that actually works because of his extensive background in it. Um, and even if I disagree with Joe, I, I always have to sit back, sit down, and take a deep breath and ask myself, is it wise to disagree with Joe Vest? Uh, so Joe, do you want to talk a little bit about your background and, and where you're at now? Oh man, John, that's uh, that's too much right there. But uh, yeah, just disagree with what I say. So I, I just get on the stage and rant about things. I'm an old guy who's been ranting. Uh, but yeah, my background is I've been done done IT for you know 20 plus years and uh, shifted to security about 2011, 2010 timeframe and kind of focused on, you can call the offensive security side of things where I got into application security, penetration testing, and it shifted into red teaming by 2012. And I've been focusing on that world for a long time. And, and I go down from the technical side all the way to the, I'll call the administrative side. And I've really found a passion, which is the boring side of the, of this industry to where, where it really matters. You know, um, there's a lot of great people out there focusing on in-depth technical and not that I can't go and do that, but I just see huge gaps on the other side. So I've really focused on how do you actually operationalize this and make it make sense? Um, 
you can take the smartest and greatest people and put them in a room. And if no one understands what's going on, it really means nothing. And that's been a kind of a strong platform that I've used to try to say, what is, what's the industry really need? How do we actually use this red teaming thing to improve the state of security? And, and that's really been the kind of focus that I've wanted to, to understand. And I've grown and understood and, and I listen to the security defensive community to understand where their gaps are, what their assumptions are and how things work. And that's just really what I've been doing. Okay, rock on. And with that, uh, Shelby, Megan, Velda, Rick, yes, Jake, I was I think just... that's our team. That's the BHIS team. You see them on a lot of our stuff, and you'll get mm -hmm. to know them throughout the day. But is it about time? Are we ready? It is. We're at the top that's of the hour. Day. I was um, going to go over our housekeeping notes one more time for everybody before I let Corey and Joe take it away. Um, so I do want to remind everybody that this session is being recorded. So if you can't stick around for the whole five hours, that is okay. We will have all the talks up on our YouTube channel within a few weeks. Um, along with that, all the slide decks from today are going to be posted in the slides channel in our Discord server, which brings me to my next point. If you aren't already on our Discord server, please go ahead and join that now. All of the chat for today, along with the QA, is going to take place through the Discord server. Um, we've shared the link to it inside the GoToWebinar chat for everybody. And I'm also just going to show everyone the Discord server real quick in case this is your first time in Discord. So we're in the Wild West Hacking Fest server in the live chat channel with the little bull head here. Um, you can see it's pretty easy to just type in a message and send it to everybody. Um, if you want to at one of the instructors specifically, you can at them and then type in their name. We also have a speaker role that you can add as well. And with that, if you want to join in on sharing the fun gifts, there is the GIF button on the right-hand side over here, where you can also find emojis and stuff like that. And the slides channel, where you'll find the slide decks, are going to be right above the live chat in here. And with that, I'll let you guys take it away. All right. So I'm going to introduce Joe here. Uh, throw his bio out there. Um, as he said, he has 20 years of experience in red teaming, penetration testing, and application security. He's also the technical director for uh, Cobalt Strike at Help Systems. Uh, he's also authored the book, Red Team Development and Operations. He's the original author of the SANS 564 Red Team course. He has done leads for a red team on uh, for the DOD, and he uh, owned a security consulting company and was a former director at Spectre Ops. Um, most recently, he authored the uh, community kit for Cobalt Strike. Uh, all around awesome dude. Let's take it away, Joe. <laughs> hey, thanks, Corey. So really what I take from when I hear someone read my bio is I don't keep a, jo a job for very long. I, <laughs> I've done too many things. That's what I've done. So um, so let's, let's get into this. So uh, thanks for the introduction. I want to open this up um, to kind of set a foundation of this whole concept of red teaming that we're looking at. Um, I think with, I hope that this complements all the other talks and it gives us a foundation and a modern look at some of the challenges we have from the whole red teaming space. And just to, to be clear, I actually fell into my own trap that I'm gonna talk about. I originally titled this, Why We Red Team, The Real Value of Threat Emulation. And I realized, oh, I fell, into, I fell into my own trap. We'll talk about that as I go through this, but I shifted this to the real value of threat-based engagements. And that's really, really important as a concept as, as we go through this. So let's start off by saying red teaming is, and I got to stop myself right there. I don't want to fall into this. Again, this is another trap. If I pulled the entire community that's listening to this, what is red teaming? We're going to get 100 different answers. So we as a group can't even agree on what this stuff is. So it's almost futile to start start defining these things from this point of view. So instead of taking a look at what red teaming is, let's take a step back. We need to understand the problem set that we're really trying to face. What are we really trying to solve? We need to understand this. So instead of predefining all of these things and limiting ourselves early on, let's take a step back, understand what, what, what's our point? What are we even doing here? And uh, so this all begins with security operations, the normal boring part of things, you know, you always hear the terms, people or processes and technology things. These actually really, really do matter. And they're really important because ultimately from this threat emulation, red teaming, I'll just leave those loose terms for now. 
um, we're trying to understand this security operations problem set. So if you look at security operations, why does it exist? You spend a lot of money, you spend, you know, with people, processes, and technology, a lot of time and energy in order to prevent, detect, assess, monitor um, against cybersecurity threats. That's really what this, the whole um, security operations challenge set is. It's to defend against threats. I would actually argue this includes our red teams. So those that are actually engaging in these threat-based tests, you're part of this. You are not a separate piece. You are a part of this. So on that note, I want to take a little sidestep over here and get on my soapbox. Because um, I want you to consider these, uh, consider this as I go through this talk. So think about this. Red is a component of blue. And when I mean red, I mean offensive security, uh, all of the security, uh, offensive security testing processes, vulnerability assessment, penetration testing, red teaming, all of this, the entire set. Red is a component of blue or the defenders. Blue can exist without red completely. You can have a whole defensive posture that has no offensive security processes. Red cannot exist without blue. You can't have that. If, the, if red does exist, that's criminal. That's what criminals are doing. So this is important to understand that the whole overall goal of what we're fo focusing on is not to do some sort of offensive security technique or tactic or something new and uh, fancy and shiny, but we are really trying to impact security operations ability. That's really, that's really important to kind of think through this concept. Help us redefine and re-understand where we're going to get value from this. So we'll start back with security operations. We got to start with the design. How do these things come to be? How does this security operations program actually get built? You start off early on and, and you're looking at a team and organizations building out this program. They get pressures from all different sources. They've got compliance, they've got customers, they read things in the news, they have limited resources, all of these competing pieces to do security. I mean, you could even argue that um, no one's business is security. Anyone who's really building out these programs, they have to build their widgets, sell their services. That's what they care about. This security piece is just a bolt-on or something else. So it's important to understand that context when these programs are being built. So although there's challenges, people overcome these, and they can build what's overcome, at least um, on paper, they can build something that's considered robust. So, okay, that's good. That's robust. We can actually please various parties. I can read through the documentation. Everything looks good. Everything looks like, hey, I think this is a solid plan to, uh, to work against a threat, an attack. So we can design these things. It looks good on paper. Well, how do we validate this? How are we going to test and measure this? Well, oftentimes we're going to validate it against some standard audit and compliance checks so we can get some green check boxes from there. We do our normal patch management and some of our, our Band-Aid security, which there's nothing wrong with that, but we put this out there to try to um, reduce the attack surface. We go do some security testing. This is vulnerability assessments, pen tests, application security assessments, the kind of standard go-to security tests that are driven by multiple ways. And, and overall, when this thing is done, we have good security hygiene. So we have programs that are built. They have good hygiene. We're missing something. So something is missing because if this model worked, we wouldn't have these conversations. Security would have been solved. So why do we keep seeing repeated failures in creating solid security operations programs? So let's kind of take a step back and look at the shortcomings. So we can kind of see where these are design, where these designs come from, but let's look at the shortcomings. So first of all, rarely are any of these built from some sort of new, something new. These are built on existing environments and, and they're just constantly piled on and constantly piled on. So this is where things start from. So you have this, then you have to think, well, who is responsible for the design and implementation of these security programs? Who's coming up with the ideas to say, this is how we glue together our people processes and technology to achieve our goals. Um, where did this information come from? So how did that information come to, to this group to actually build, for, build from? And I'm leading into this, these questions to start thinking, to what level has someone on this team compromised a well-defended network? I mean, is this, did someone take a course and said, I took my CEH course or some other course, and now I understand how this works, or I've actually gone through more comprehensive uh, threat design, like an emulation or adversary emulation or threat emulation type test, red teaming. Where does that line come from? And I ask this question because when you look at this overall security um, program, have we included, how was the threat included in this decision-making process? That's really important to understand because this is where we're going to start to see the gap. So I use this question when I talk to organizations and I'm trying to understand 
um, the point of view of what, how this security views security and how their infrastructure security um, or their security operations program was designed. So are organizations really building security programs designed to address the threat? That's a question you've got to ask. And up until this point, I really feel like this is our gap that we're missing. So we're not designing it to build to go against a threat. Then I have to ask that same question, similar to if I asked everyone what red teaming is, I said, what's threat? Well, I'm going to get a lot of different answers. So let's dive into that and explore what this is. So what is a threat? You can look at some of the common definitions we have where it's some person or thing likely to cause damage. We can add cyber to it and then kind of put the cyber spin to where it's a malicious attempt to cause damage or disrupt a network. And this is often represented in this risk score. And there's nothing wrong with this, but again, if this is all we needed to do, we're trying to prevent this threat, which is some sort of uh, factor of risk, would we not have already solved this problem? We're missing something. We're still missing something. So maybe the way we're approaching what we call threat, which security operations is ultimately trying to impact, we need to kind of think about that slightly different. So let's talk about threat actors. So we look at security operations that focuses on a thing. So we, we have threat as a thing, you know, malware, some malicious tool, virus, something like that's a thing. What about the individuals behind these tools? So Let's take an example of something that's a thing threat. I'll use PS exec because it's a, it's a good one to work with because I'll ask you, is it a threat? Well, based on some of our prior definition, we could say, yes, it is because it could be used for bad, but it could be used for good. But where is that line and how do you measure risk against it? So we might be missing something. So what can make this tool a threat? When would something like this become a threat? So we got to look at that missing link and the intent is that missing link. This is what's key. The intent behind the, uh, but some sort of tool or technique is important because it's driven by the threat actor. So tools like PS exec or RDP or Microsoft windows, all of these things can be a threat based on the intent and usage of from the threat actor. So I've got this formula here. This is not an official formula. This is me, my way of expressing this concept, because this is what we're going to start to drive to improve security operations ability to deal with what I call threat. So we're looking at threat actors plus their intent, plus their tools and techniques. This is what we're looking for as far as threat goes. So, so instead of a binary, this is a good tool, this is a bad tool, we need to put some context in it because the way the threat's going to use it with their intent can change and actually drive how we need to cause impact. So again, I'm going to ask, where's the threat in security planning? This one here can hurt sometimes. And, and, and I have said this to many, many people and many during my consulting days, I, I would say things along this lines, but I say regarding your security operations program, good intentions by intelligent people do not add up to understanding threats or how they operate. I've been in rooms with people much smarter than me designing and building out security programs, but they really do not understand what they're actually defending against. They create a lot of extra work and they're wasting a lot of time and resources. And then you can have a simple, and I'll even say, especially in my early days, simple threat portrayer do some sort of simple threat uh, action, um, like through a red team engagement, and I have high success against a well-defended environment. Like, why is this the case? I am just a lowly hacker trying to go through this. So where was these gaps? And it took me a long time to learn to realize this, but I realized these intelligent people who are building this are building something without building it towards the goals that they're trying to achieve and missing threat in this entire process. So you see this and you see some news. This happens all the time. Okay, this thing was hacked. So when you clicked on this link, game over, everything's bad. This view that I see that comes from our media um, often narrows down all these complexities into some sort of binary event. You were hacked. Everything is bad. This is actually really damaging to our security industry, especially when you're looking at news articles that are feeding leadership who's trying to figure out how to allocate resources to build a security program. See these things. And this leads to some of those concepts of like, you know, I don't want anyone to hack my firewall or, you know, keep all the bad guys out. These are the things that happen because they become very, very binary to where all these attacks are just one thing. 
but attacks are never one not um, they're never one and done. You don't just have a hey you were hacked. That oversimplification causes us to think about how to protect against these threats. Um, it really weakens our overall security. You look at a long series of events that must occur in order for an attack, a threat to actually be successful. So you're looking at a threat actor using intent and tools multiple times over and over and over to achieve some sort of goal. So that's important to understand that if you actually start to apply this concept of threat in your security defenses, you can actually see that you really do have the upper hand over the threats because you can impact their goals. And you're going to start to see how do we actually define what is success? And this is really, really important to understand. But we often focus way, way too deep on some sort of new exploit. What's the new hot there for some exploit? Oh, Microsoft is vulnerable to this, or oh, there's this new tool. It's like, okay, those come and go. These are ephemeral. But a single exploit and a single attack never complete an entire attack chain. And that's really important, especially when you're trying to talk to leadership about how you actually make a good program. So let's redefine security operations in terms of what I call these pillars of security. These are not official pillars. Um, I often use NIST cybersecurity framework, the IPDRR, identify, detect, protect, respond, and re uh, restore or recover. I use those often as well, but I like to keep it simple, especially when you're trying to go a top-down approach. Let's see, what are we really trying to do? What's the goal of security operations? We're looking at the goal is to prevent, detect, and respond to a threat actor before they successfully achieve their goal. This statement alone can help you start to shift how you actually engage from a threat-based uh, engagement and how you measure success or not. Getting hacked or getting an exploit to successfully running on a target or getting code execution is only one step in a long chain of events. We're really here to stop the threat from achieving their goal. I can't stop someone kicking my door down. You know, if they have a big enough, a strong enough foot, strong enough leg, they're gonna kick my door down. But can I stop them from achieving whatever their goal is doing? You know, possibly. But if we just have this binary, you are hacked or not hacked, we're gonna lose over and over and over. We're gonna miss out on opportunities to impact a threat. So let's pause and look at this. Isn't the identification mitigations of vulnerabilities enough? Why do we need to bother with some sort of threat-based approach? I ask this because I'm gonna assume everyone on this call says, of course it's not enough. But if you look at the actions taken by organizations, what is the most common thing that's being done? We find some bad things and we fix those bad things. So we're looking at this from one perspective. So we're really looking at, can we patch ourselves to security? That's often kind of the approach that we're doing. So it's not enough, but why are we not doing more? And when I say doing more, looking at this from the security operations side, not just from the test, uh, the security testing community side. So how do we measure ourselves? I kind of mentioned that we're looking at some sort of process to find some flaws and fix these flaws. So we can use audit and compliance. We can use standard security tests, vulnerability assessments, penetration tests, application security tests. And these are really, really good and important. I do not want to downplay the importance of understanding this. But all of the results that come from doing these ultimately fall to prevention. They rarely have any impact over detection response. So when you're looking at trying to understand security operations ability to impact a threat, well, if we stay in the prevention side, we're always going to lose. And too often organizations really, really focusing on, we've got to find all these flaws and we've got to fix all these flaws. And, and that's great because you're going to reduce the attack surface, but it's impossible to reduce an attack surface to zero. We've got to follow this up with some sort of detection response capability. So you're starting to see some of the value that we need to have in the, in the threat-focused tests. These tests are going to actually enable us to work through a detection and response process. So again, I like to keep things simple. I'm looking at this from a top-down approach. I can expand this into some sort of attack framework where it's got multiple phases from you know, seven or eight phases to get through an entire attack. But let's kind of take a step back and see what we're what a threat needs to do. And again, a threat is a threat actor with intent that's using some tools or technique to achieve a goal. So, well, first of all, we, we have to be able to get in. 
So you're looking at exploitation phase, if you will. I've got to be able to get some sort of access and gain access to a target network. This is where we spend a tremendous amount of time um, on our de actual defenses that we deploy. And that's great. We want to prevent this, but this is a small phase. And when you look in the opportunity to impact a threat, this is a blip in the overall um, opportunity to actually impact a threat. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say with phishing, I'm able to convince a user to click a fish, download a binary, do something, get command and control established. Well, you're looking at a small, small sliver of things in this exploitation phase. Once I get past that and I maintain access, now I'm actually establishing command and control. I have to get my persistence. I'm laterally moving. I'm enumerating systems. I am really ramping up my um, uh, um, actions on a target. So detection, opportunities for detection go through the roof at this phase. And if we only focus on this get in phase, we're going to lose. And I know that anyone here who does red teaming and stuff, you understand this. But again, I'm looking at this from the security operations perspective. And does your security operations team actually truly understand this? Or are you trying to roll a rock uphill and say, let me show you how I can do all these bad guy things? If you do, it's going to be tough. So we really got to kind of work backwards, understand and put this as a, at a core understanding of our security operations teams to make sure that they actually can do this so they can take steps to measure their efficiency uh, properly. So this model, find the bad, fix the bad. This is incomplete, but this is what we do. Um, how often do you have some sort of security report, bone testing, pen testing, even red teaming, that has a list of vulnerabilities or a list of findings? Immediately, when you present it in this way, you're saying, I found a bunch of bad, let's go fix those bad. Most of the time, these lead towards the prevention side. So I, I found an occur, I'm doing a red team engagement. I do some Kerber roasting. Okay. So I found some Kerber roastable accounts like, oh, this is bad. We need to make sure that we reduce this ability to do Kerber roasting. Okay. So you reduce that. That's an, that's one attack vector that was reduced, which is good, but you still have not really impacted detection and response unless you're actively using that as part of your measurement and not just saying, could I do it? But how could have security operations have defended against this? So instead of thinking of this in terms of, let's give you a big list of findings, all the bad so we can fix them, let's look at this in terms of what mitigations can be applied from this model. If we kind of flip this on its head, this is the actual actionable steps that can be taken, and we look at this mitigations. It gives us a slight different view as to how to present findings from a threat-based test. So if we compare testing types through the eyes of mitigations, um, we start to look through this. And I'm going to use vulnerability assessments, pen testing, red teaming as kind of the go-to. Red teaming, we'll get to that in a moment. But this is kind of the, the core main security testing types. So let's just kind of walk through this so we can understand what these actually deliver. So again, everything is in terms of security operations. How do we impact security operations to raise the level of security and reduce a threat's ability to be successful? That's really what we're trying to do. If I just give you a list of findings and it goes on a shelf, it does nothing. So vulnerability assessments, at the core, it's designed to identify flaws. If these flaws are mitigated, again, let's look at in terms of mitigation, then our attack surface is reduced. So we reduce the attack surface. So we should consider vulnerability assessments as an uh, effort in attack surface reduction. That's what it's for. So instead of here's a bunch of findings, Vulnerability assessments are an effort in attack surface reduction. And that's great. We, by reducing the attack surface, we minimize the noise. And if we take advantage of it, we can maximize our detection and response capabilities. So it's exactly what it's needed for. So when I go through these assessments, one is not better than the other. These are mutually exclusive. And they all need to be conducted so that you have a comprehensive uh, security program, or at least a comprehensive way of measuring the capabilities of a security program. This is what's important. Um, we go into penetration testing. So penetration testing is to really designed to identify the relationship between flaws. Penetration tests can be extremely technical. And I often find that penetration tests are more than enough to do for many organizations when they want to do something like a red team. Because the goal winds up being, let's identify all of the attack paths. Let's identify the relationships between these flaws. Let's understand this. So these can be extremely technical and very in-depth. Again, 
after we conduct one of these penetration tests, if we go through a mitigation phase, we're reducing the attack surface. Back to my Kerber roast account. If I do a penetration test that includes Kerber roasting and I identify some vulnerable accounts or, or um, possibilities to conduct Kerber roasting and crack those credentials, well, we might want to fix that and reduce the attack surface so that the likelihood of that occurring again is lower. So again, penetration testing is an effort in attack surface reduction. As long as we consider it that way, we're never going to make penetration more or less than what it is. Then we get into red teaming, I mean, threat-based testing. So forget the word red teaming. Just forget that right now because it, gets into a, it, it comes with too much baggage. I'm honestly not a fan of the word anymore. It get, has too much baggage. So this threat-based testing is designed to understand the ability for security operations to deal with a threat. If the weaknesses are mitigated, then we raise the bar for threats to be able to succeed. This is what we're looking for. We're really trying to understand and measure security operations as a whole ability to impact a threat. Now, this is a very broad and wide area. You have people, processes, technology. You have multiple ways of viewing this, which is why I call it testing. And you see in this little bulb, this box, I have pen testing, threat assessment, red teaming, adversarial assessment, all of these different terms. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment, but they really don't matter because really you're going to create some scenario, measure that scenario, and see how security operations responds. So this is the gap that we're really trying to fill here. So how do you get value from these tests? So this is the overall kind of uh, component of what I'm trying to share with this talk. So how do you actually get value from this? First of all, adopt the model, prevent first, detect always. And when I say adopt this model, your red teams, your adversary uh, emulation teams, whatever you want to call these, should adopt this model because technically red is a component of blue. So security operations as a whole should adopt this model motto of we want to prevent first, but detect always. So if you have this motto in place and this drives what you're doing in security operations, you will by nature, start to impact a threat's ability to succeed because you're going to get increase the detection opportunities, which will increase your response capabilities. So can't just focus on prevention. It's impossible to um, prevent everything. There are always some zero-day attack, whether they exist publicly or privately, or just or someone messes up. We're human. There could be misconfigurations that occur. So there's always an opportunity. And this opportunity changes over time so sometimes it's kind of ebbs and flows on whether or not um, getting that initial access some of that code execution is going to work but we really want to shift from prevention only to prevention detection response so we can impact a threat from achieving their goal that's really what we're looking for and if you can adopt to that yes someone can gain access to my system do code execution but they were unsuccessful in achieving their goal, whether this is ransomware, stealing, my intellectual property, whatever it is, then that's a win. That's a win for security operations. You will fail if you think you're going to keep all bad out all the time. It will drive you nuts and you will never, uh, you, you just will not, you'll lose. So big piece here, big pet peeve of mine right now. Uh, don't get into a definition battle. Um, I often see, you know, presentations I actually did a I was on a panel for DEF CON and part one of the conversations was what's the difference between adversary emulation and adversary simulation and immediately we're just going to go into who's the smartest in the room who knows the best you know who can talk the best about these uh, different definitions and I'm going to say I don't care none of them matter if you get into the this just think of these as marketing terms these are buzzwords that's all this is um, don't worry about trying to start from this um, red teaming or adversary simulation or an emulation, what are you going to call it? Because you're going to limit yourself immediately. So don't really worry about that. So I don't care what you call them. I actually call everything security assessments because that's what we're doing. We're assessing security. So when I do this, when I set up something, instead of saying, hey, I want a red team or I want a purple team or whatever color team you want, this type of engagement, let's not worry about that. Let's understand the problems that we're trying to deal with. So there's a problem set within security operations. Let's look at those goals. Let's actually get into those things. And then if you really want to label it, then go ahead and label it. But that's not important to label. So what do I mean by this? I actually include vulnerability assessments and pen testing in this as well, because everything ultimately is a security assessment. So if we have a security assessment with the goal of identifying vulnerabilities on user workstations, there we go. That's 
that is enough to understand what we're working on. From that statement, we can actually start to craft out the test requirements. So how do we go and can do this? Well, this could be mapped to what's normally called a vulnerability assessment, which is optional. And there's nothing wrong with mapping it back to something like this, but you wanna start with, what are you trying to do? What are the goals of this things you're going through? When I just see, hey, come do a red, red team assessment, ha come hack me, bro, um, approach, it it's weird because there's no real goals. It's just, okay, you're gonna give your red team a lot of fun to go play with exploits and go do some fun things. And that's what you get out of it. So me as a red teamer and, and been on the keyboard doing stuff, I've had a lot of fun just hacking away and playing. But the results are weak because the engagement started off poorly defined. It's just like, go hack stuff and let's see what happens. It's terrible. It's, it's not going to help security operations. You're just going to be fine more and, and that's it. So what about something like... Uh, we have a security assessment with the goal of understanding our detection strategy. Our detection strategy is functioning as expected. This might be mapped to purple teaming. So again, we're looking at narrow level detection strategies. Perhaps I have the detection strategy from that says, again, curb roasting. I want to be able to detect curb roasting attacks. So that's a strategy we've deployed using people processes and technologies. We can actually craft a, a test that's oftentimes labeled in the purple team side Let's go and look at this at a low level, sometimes maybe atomic testing, if you will. We want to look at this and actually run through in a scenario that will help us understand, do our detection strategies work? Where are the gaps of these detection strategies? On that note, uh, kind of a tangent, um, if you haven't followed Jared Atkinson over at Spectre Ops, he does a lot of really, really good work on detection engineering. And after working with him, really seeing the other side, you will, the blue side to understand, I have actually shaped a lot of my approaches to point any sort of security assessment I do towards some sort of detection strategy or a defensive story to help improve that defensive story. So there's actual ways of documenting and working through your detection uh, problem set and classifying that. You know, you can use something like uh, Palantir's um, alerting and detection strategy, which is actually a formal way of documenting your strategies. Anyways, that's a whole other talk that you can go down, but it's really important because I consider it the other end of what we're working on from threat-based assessments that I try to push towards. I look at how am I going to raise the bar for security and improve the prevention, detection, and response from security operations. So we also had to get um, benefit from these tests is challenge security defensive assumptions. If I go back to red teaming, the way when this was created as a, as a thing, it re, the goal of red teaming originally was really about challenging assumptions. That's really what it was there. It was, if you've watched, um, uh, you know, the 10th man rule, it's basically, you know, in a room of 10 people, it's the job of one person to say, no, this is zombies. So that's what it is. So that's our job from the start emulation side. We want to challenge these assumptions. So when you hear things like only privileged users have access to that database or, oh yeah, we would detect that, but no one had ever used that. Attacker would not do that. Or this is system isn't important. When I hear these um, remarks like this, I look at, oh, these are goals to measure. We want to actually include this into our scenario to actually measure this. You're not here to try to prove like how I'm smarter than you, but you hope that your goal would be, you prove these to be true. Prove them to be true and move on. If they're not true, those are serious assumptions that have been made by this, the um, defensive posture that need to be understood and measured. So this is another aspect that you can use threat-based simulate uh, threat-based testing for. We also want to measure and understand security operations' ability to impact a threat. This would I'd be argue I would argue is kind of the core precept of what we're looking at. If you want to put a label on it, this is really where I label red teaming as a whole. This is what we're trying to do. The results of these security tests are not here to identify more flaws, although they may. Those should be secondary, especially if you're doing reporting, and you really want to say present the view of how was security operations able to impact me as a threat going through this scenario. Was it easy? Was it hard? What extra things did I have to do? Did you detect me? Did you not detect me? All of these things are what you want to put into your threat scenario. Oftentimes, this is what's conducted, what I would call a traditional red team engagement. 
This is really where the heart of that is. But you're really, really trying to understand me as playing threat. Was I able to succeed in my goal? That's what you want to measure because this is what security operations is all about. This is the core component of why we have security operations. So we also have to train defenders. Um, this is really, really important and well overlooked. Um, and when I say train defenders, I mean actually train them on live production systems, the people, processes, and technology that's used to defend this environment actually put to the test. Live fire testing on production systems. I hear too often, oh, we can't do that, it's production, the risk is too high. Well, that's fine. Then I don't hear the risk is too high. I hear we accept that a real bad guy can do whatever they want when they get on a network because we're not going to go walk through that because it's too dangerous. That's what I hear. And, and I and you can state that. And you put those acceptances. And say, we accept that bad guys will test this before we do. And it, what I mean by this is think about the whole firefighter example. If you were new, you, hey, you're a firefighter team. It's like, oh, we're going to go do a fire. It's like, uh, I don't even know how to put these boots on, put this suit on. I don't know how to drive this truck. Um, okay, let's go. I, I guess it's kind of like driving a car. And, and you go there. Are you going to succeed in um, combating that fire? Not at all. But we in the security industry, especially leadership, I only say security leadership, leadership in organizations do a disservice to their teams but by not allowing them to train. And I mean not just taking a course somewhere. There's nothing wrong. Courses are great. But at some point, you've got to put this to the test. Um, a really good example I have was I was working through an engagement. You read through all the documentation. So kind of a traditional red team engagement that had some goals of uh, causing some operational impact to actually measure the whole ability to uh, prevent, detect, and respond. So kind of that, that was the model of this engagement. Well, when you read throughout the documentation, everything looks solid. Their plans look good. Their, their tools look good. Everything was really like, wow, this is going to be a hard engagement. Well, early on, by knowing this from as, a, as a, an intelligent threat actor, you're able to craft attacks that allow you to gain access. You start to go low and slow, and you realize, okay, now I understand where those limits are and what can or cannot be detected. So you start to work through this. Eventually, because we are trying to stimulate the, the, uh, the defenders to actually practice their detection response capabilities, you elevate this to be loud. So you can crank up the volume. Basically, in this case, it was, hey, we're here. We've taken over your, your network. Now, this was many, many years ago, um, and it could be almost similar to like a ransomware uh, attack now. If you want to use it that way, where it's like, here's an announcement of something so you know immediately. Well, as soon as this was announced, command and control and all access from our team was lost within 15 minutes. I was like, okay, there. So we stimulated and a response was, occurred. The response was literally hair on fire, ripping cables out of the wall in a data center. So I think, okay, they took their plan, they took their book and threw it out the window and they ripped this apart. So not only was the response really, really poor, and unless we tested this on a live environment, we would have never known, their response was poor, did not follow what they wanted to do. It took them over eight hours to bring their network back up to speed. Why? Because their recovery processes were not being followed. So in case, if you're not familiar, if you restart servers and services, there's typically an order you have to start things. So you've got to follow a process to make sure that any superseding services are ready to go so you can bring things up. It took over eight hours to figure out the right boot order. So by going through this engagement, we actually learned how some serious weaknesses in the security operations processes. So we really focused on that process side in this and the fact that the people weren't following those processes. So it was nuts. It was a crazy engagement and people were not happy with us as a testing team, but it really did allow us to test. Side note on that, if you do those types of engagements, be careful because they can be very high stressful and you want to limit the number of times you put people through a fire drill because it can be extremely difficult and stressful uh, for your security defensive teams. But it's really, really valuable to actually go and see how this plays out because better to play out in an environment where we as the threat can say, okay, we're done. You know, that was just us. This is just a drill versus having a real threat on your network and go, oh, wow, we actually, this is not learning anymore. We've got to survive this and get through this. So 
we need to, you also want to adopt an observation and measure it coverage model. And, and I use a few different versions of this. So I'm gonna go back to the prevention detection response model that I use. And this right here is really, really good to help share leadership with where we need to start applying um, these security tests and what value we get based on others. So when you're talking about looking at budget, resources, and value on what is needed, you can use something like this. So, so I'm using the kind of three testing types. You can add more if you'd like, but vulnerability assessments, pen test, and some sort of threat-based test. You can even throw in the word red team if you'd like, just to keep it simple. But what are the goals? When I go back to vulnerability assess or vulnerability assessments. The goal, if you the mitigation, um, if you apply the mitigations from a threat uh, vulnerability assessment to reduce the attack surface, which really focuses in the prevention uh, pillar. So that's really what it is. It really helps lower that attack surface, which is great. By lowering the attack surface, again, that gives us opportunity to have less noise and increase our detection response capability. But it doesn't help us test that. Pen testing focuses on that prevention side often. It can go into detection, but most of the time when you're looking at the, the way these tests are goals, the goals and the actual execution of these, they're really, really short and fast, and they're really about measuring the relationship between flaws. In other words, let's attack, identify all these attack paths and move forward. So detection is iffy. So sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. We finally get into the threat-based assessment where we actually design a security assessment with specific security operation goals. And this gives us the entire gamut of this. Now, on that note, although I show that you can do everything with threat-based engagements, you really need those pen testing and vulnerability assessment types in order to get good coverage, because you do want to reduce your attack surface. You don't want to make it easy for the threat. So you want to make sure you have good hygiene and good housekeeping to, to minimize that. But you want to back it up with actually measuring and make sure you understand your entire security operations process. And I see a ton of stuff on chat, so I don't, I'm not sure what's going on, but maybe I can respond to that in a bit. Um, so we want to, uh, you want to make sure you use this. So this helps me a lot when I discuss with leadership to say, let's really talk about what we're trying to do and what is our goal. Um, so, so a few tips on threat-based testing. So getting value out of this and understanding what you're, you're working through. Don't get hung up on the names. Um, anytime you see on Twitter when people start arguing between emulations, simulation and stuff, you've already lost. It's not important. The goals of what you're trying to measure and understand are what's important. Call it whatever you want, but red teaming, threat emulation, threat simulation, I consider all these buzzwords and marketing terms, I mean, which is fine. I mean, you might want to label it something, but what really matters is what are you trying to do and how are you going to measure it? You know, all the boring stuff when you look at this. So this is all the boring stuff, but I would say on that note, kind of a side tangent, we as red, if we're playing red, we do not have our own playground. And this is important. We are invited to someone else's playground, whether you are an internal team and are invited via permission to come play, or you're an external team who've been invited to say, hey, you're allowed to come play. We might have some really cool tools. We might have all the nice toys and can bring some stuff. But if we don't play nice and don't play fair, we're going to get kicked out. It doesn't matter how good we are, what we can do. We don't have our own playground to play it. And if you do have your own playground, well, you're not going to improve security. You're just going to go over there and kind of poke around and and play and learn some things, but you're not actually going to increase security operations for some organization. So just remember that. Um, don't just report findings. Findings I typically put as a as a an appendix or like a second level piece. You really want to understand the uh, how impact, how the, the goals were impacted. So whatever those goals were regarding security operations, maybe with through prevention, detection, or response, you really want to present your observations through that eyes. And uh, this can lead into consider reporting the items in terms of your mitigations. In other words, how will this become better in terms of our opportunities? Um, I often use this fourth item attack diagram as my entire way of presenting a, a my final conclusions from some sort of engagement. I don't have a lot of slides. I typically try to have one slide that's the diagram. And if it's a bigger one, I may have two, but basically it's a one picture you know, the whole picture's worth a thousand words that actually will help us walk through the entire scenario that we just executed. And this is extremely beneficial to share everything with 
the security, the defending team with the blue side, with security operations as a whole, because ultimately we're trying to share as much as we can to raise that bar. So doing this at a high level with a diagram is really, really helpful. And you follow that up with a the narrative. So the narrative is just going to be all of the, uh, the, the details about each one of these phases of, uh, of the scenario that you want to work through. Another piece that I see is missed often is include detection opportunities. Um, whether this is a lot, you know, a separate part of your report or embedded somewhere, have opportunity to say, here are areas based on the types of uh, threat activities I did that were missed through some sort of detection. Whether this was you utilize some sort of bypass or some different technique, or um, maybe you, it was just completely uh, missed. Regardless of that, include that because these detection opportunities, if an organization is starting to work through a maturity model and actually start to document their detection strategies, this is a perfect way to align and look to see, do our detection strategies map up with these opportunities that we just missed? Because this can be done later on and you can start to look at this. And I like to look at these as ways of doing follow-up small tests. Sometimes that might be called purple teaming. But when you start to look at, let's look at this at a narrow level to say, hey, let's look through these detection opportunities we missed and why we missed that. So especially in an internal team where you might have a little flexibility on, on quickly knocking some of these engagements out, this is a perfect way to follow on to an engagement and try to continue to raise that bar. And that gets into mapping, try to map your observations to a detection strategy. Now, not everyone uses detection strategy process, but I still like to say, this is the assumption I had from a detection standpoint. So here's what you could have detected. So this six and seven kind of go hand in hand, but if you actually have an organization that has detailed detection strategies, you can use this as a, uh, as a means to, um, to raise that uh, awareness so we can actually cause an impact. Again, we're really trying to shift towards away from just prevention, but from detection and response. So my takeaways. So I'm gonna kind of wrap this up here. Um, you need to challenge these security exceptions. I always say threat must have a vote to what's implemented in security operations. This is really, really important. So you've got it, threats got to have a vote at the table. If your team is building a bunch of things, and I have my little silly cartoon here about everyone building all these security pieces, threats over here doing their thing, oblivious to what's going on because threat does not have a vote in what we're actually doing in security operations. Again, security operations goal is not to lock down our firewalls and deploy AV and EDR. The goal is to impact a threat so that threat is not successful. So make sure that we include threat in our security decision processes. We want to measure security operations ability to deal with this. So not only do we want to include threat, we need to actually measure this to say, okay, so we are including threat into this. How well are we doing? Can we actually detect and respond to various scenarios? So I like to just pull any scenario off the, off the web of something, look at some threat report and decompose that into something I can actually work through and then rebuild that into a test plan and, and walk through this. Would we detect, prevent, detect, or respond this thing? And that's a really, really good way of creating some sort of engagement is just to decompose some realistic threats and then rebuild them into your own plan. And finally, training is key. We've got to let our teams practice. And, and yes, again, be cautious with this because blue teams are often overstressed and overworked. Uh, but I would actually argue if we can improve our security operations processes, we might be able to cut down some of the junk that our defenders have to work through and start to focus on what really, really matters. Um, and good solid testing, threat-based testing can actually show you what's important and what's not important. And you can actually start to shift that model and uh, increase Blue's ability to, uh, to be productive. And with that, I wanna thank everybody for taking the time to listen to me uh, on this talk. Hey, thanks, Joe Vest. So uh, we had a couple questions in chat. Uh, I'll let you get to those when you get a minute. Um, you have to point me to them. I, I have, uh, was there, oh gosh, I'm trying to flip back through and I see a lot of conversations. So forgive me if I miss something, but is there certain questions that you can help me uh, find? 
Yeah, I would say uh, Gonzo Sec had a couple questions for you uh, revolving around uh, kind of some resources to point people towards for training up on detection and response. So uh, for training and detection response, I'm going to, uh, you know, you know, Take it what you will, because I, I know Jared personally, looking at Jared over Spectre Ops, uh, all of his blog posts on detection engineering. It's a really, really good spot to start to understand uh, how to decompose these detection problems into something that can be classified and managed and, and understood. So instead of just like looking at, we want to detect all these bad tools, you can actually start to look at the fundamentals of how do these techniques work? Because think about this, everything we do, let's always keep windows in mind. Um, no matter how creative we are, we're still work within the bounds of what these systems give us, the APIs and everything. The only difference between, say, a professional developer writing a game versus someone writing, say, malware, is just the intent and the goals. So ultimately, we're just calling these same things. So understanding the principle, principles about how these things work and then what telemetry we can actually capture. So uh, again, I would just recommend reading through his blog posts on detection engineering, and, and you can really start to see uh, a nice way to, to begin to classify these things. Okay, thanks, Joe. And if you could uh, post your slides over to the uh, slides channel, uh, that oh, way people yeah, yeah. Can, uh, can review, because we had a lot of comments about people saying this was really useful information. Uh, Joe, I just gave you permission to do so, so you should be able to post them in the slides channel now. And just a reminder to everybody, if you do have more questions for Joe once we move on, feel free to at his uh, username inside Discord so he can see the message and answer your question yeah, for you. Yeah, if I missed something, I saw a lot of comments and such, so I, I do want to thank everyone for listening to me talk about the boring side of security, uh, but it, I still think it's, it's really, really important. It, it's what we're all working on. No, your talk was great, man. We really appreciate it.